Amen. If you can remain standing, I'm going to be reading from Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 11. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cut bare to the king. Thank you. You may be seated. Um, today's message is called When God's uh, Calling You to Act, Part 2. We just began a series last Sunday on uh, going through the book of Nehemiah. And uh, exciting, exciting book. The series is called Faithfulness to God's Call During Troubled Times. And uh, as we mentioned last week, God's called and it's a place to call in every person's life, every believer's life. We have that call. Actually, people who don't know them have a call. They just don't know it yet. First, their first call is knowing Jesus, of course. And then when they do, God gifts them and calls them for a particular service. Wow. What an opportunity. What other people are looking for, we have in Christ. Exciting stuff. We, God does have a... A plan for us to prosper us and not to harm us. A plan for a future and a hope. Amen? He does. And it's exciting to think that he has that for each one of us. And Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. For we are God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Which God God planned in advance for us to do. Well, today we're going to be looking at the second, talking about God's call, again, calling us to act. And um, last week we talked about how we're, as we journey through the book of Nehemiah, that God does have this call on our lives, even during troubled times. We, we mentioned that, that the main call, that in reality, there's, you could say there's a general call, and in and, and that sense, it's the most important call, because it's for all believers. And we investigated last week what that was, because we looked in Ephesians chapter 4 to talk about being, to live a life worthy of the calling which we've been called. And we looked as we went through for Ephesians 4, we discovered that the calling had to do with, Christ, with Christ, helping Christ build his church. He gifts us. And then he also calls us all to grow and to help his church grow. And then we we discuss, well, okay, as we all contribute our parts, uh, so we have this call, the the more specific calling and the general calling of helping him build his church, making disciples for the kingdom of God. That God also gifts us to do our little part in that general calling, have a specific calling, and help him to fulfill that general calling of helping him uh, build his church. And so what I want to do uh, today is we're going to talk a little bit more about, about how do I even discover what that call is? We mentioned about last week that God gave Nehemiah a call, a call that he could not shake, that he had learned about his people uh, who were back in Jerusalem and that they were in and the whole city was in tattered ruins and the, the gates had been burned by fire and they were like, they were like sheep. They were just huddled and, and, and that, you know, being surrounded by wolves. And, it, and it, it broke Nehemiah to the core. And then immediately he knew as he prayed, I prayed and he prayed and he prayed. He, he was able to ascertain God's call in his life, which was to help Jerusalem rebuild the wall, and then, the, and then eventually even to help rebuild the city. That was his call in his life, and he was successful at it. But it didn't come easy. Like we mentioned last week, he had to do so during very troubled times, very difficult times, both from within and from without. And we'll be looking at that more and more as we go through the book. We'll look at chapter 1, even getting into chapter 2 today. We'll see that he did not encounter, it was not, he had it easy at first, but then God called him out of easy into tough, but tough that matters. And sometimes what happens is God has a call in our lives to leave what's easy to tough and tough is what matters. Because as we go through the tough uh, and the rough times, the good things happen. God blesses it. God blesses it through the tough. We talked last week that no matter what, that I, I, mean, I used to think, I used to think that golly, if God's put a car in my life, it'd be wind at my back, right? I mean, it makes sense. Didn't I understand? No, 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 no. 
Um, that might happen at times, certainly. We can see, definitely see him working, absolutely. But often it comes with great headwinds as I fulfill his work. And so Nehemiah definitely encountered those headwinds, but yet God still blessed it. And they were able, they were able to overcome. He was able to get uh, together with the people of Jerusalem to break down every wall that, or hindrance in their way to fulfill his call of building the wall of Jerusalem. And we talk, we said, we together said, if we're going to help fulfill our calling, we need to have this mentality, which is no matter the wall, I'll fulfill my call. Do you remember we talked about that? No matter the wall, I'll fulfill my call. Can you all say that out loud with me together? No matter the wall, I'll fulfill my call. That, that, that's a statement of tenacity and faith. And that's really the main point of this whole series that we're going to be going through for the next couple months. No matter the wall, I'll fulfill my call. It's a good thing to repeat over and over and over again. This morning we're going to look at four aspects, four key aspects to help us discern what God's call is in our lives and how we can start beginning to move forward in fulfilling that call. I was reading about this one dad. He was sitting in the, in the living room. He, and he happened to know he was reading the newspaper, but he saw his daughter was on the phone. And, and he was surprised because after about 30 minutes, uh, she was off the phone. And he said, well, what's wrong, Judy? And she said, what do you mean? Well, usually you're talking on the phone for hours. But to this, this time, you're only on, you only talk for 30 minutes. How come? She said, oh, it, it was a wrong number. <laughs> I've been through that, but that's another story. Anyways, have you ever done that? I have. Guilty as charged. But anyways, you ever feel like maybe God was calling you to do something, then maybe you thought, actually, he got the wrong number? Who, me? I don't think so. <laughs> then maybe God was saying, hey, I want you to do this. It's like, no way. I am not gifted for that. I don't see myself doing that. That's just going to be too hard, too difficult. Although, you know what, God? I think you just dialed the wrong number here. But in reality, he was calling you to act. God put a call out to you, for you. And sometimes we think, what, you know, what's it, what is a calling? You know, uh, um, it may not be as so dramatic as go to India or Africa, though he does say that sometimes, doesn't he? Whatever the call. But it might have been just something around here in the area, but you know it'd be tough. But it also involved a strong urging to that you feel like you needed to do something. Something needed to be done. Someone needs to do this. You just weren't quite ready for it to be you. But God was putting it on your heart. It needs to be done. This needs to get better. There's a problem here. Danger, Will Robinson. This is a problem. And no one else seems, other people seem like, okay, it's, it's not a problem, but it's not a big deal. But for you, it's a really big deal. Could be anything. I mean, maybe it's like a strong urge, like, you know, to help with our kids' ministry, for example. Or, you know what? Hey, you know, we need a youth group. We don't have really anything going with teens right now. I feel like we need to do that. Great. So God's calling you to do that, huh? Maybe it's the idea that, of helping more with Mission Northeast or with underprivileged families in our community. Or maybe you have the desire to help with the prayer tent that we started launching out once a month in the Lakewood Town Square. Maybe it's to invest yourself with our partnership. There's so much more we could do with Kingwood Middle School. We've, we've been hindered in, in a significant way just because of the COVID situation. But I can think of there's amazing things that we could do with our partnership with KMS. Did you know that they, when we first started, before, we started partnering right before COVID broke out. And we had, it was January, so what, 2020, right? And, um, and we helped with the staff. We, uh, we popped some popcorn and that kind of thing for the staff. And, and we noticed it was Carolyn. I was like, Carolyn, where are you? Thank you. Um, we, and Sherry. We, we noticed that they had their own Bible club happening after school. Oh, that's something I'd like to invest in. They had talked over about helping them with uh, different things like working with uh, kids who are struggling. Wow, that would be a neat way to invest. Okay, maybe you think that's not helping the whole school. You help transfer, help a school by helping one student at a time. Whatever the call. And whatever the wall, fulfillment call. 
no matter what. I'm going to do it. I'm going to help Christ build his church. We heard last week Jason and Ann Carroll talk about helping young families. What a neat calling. God's got a call in each one of us, and that's to help him build his church. That's the general. And he's got specifics on how he wants each of us to participate in that. I remember when I first had a desire or a call that I never experienced before. It was to start a church. I was a youth pastor at the time, full-time youth pastor, and we were seeing kids come to Christ through our youth group and a lot of outreach activities that we had done. But every time they came to church, they, they had a hard time adjusting to the culture of church. And so I, thought, I started thinking, wouldn't it be interesting if we were able to develop a church that, uh, that wouldn't be so hard for young people to come in and feel out of place, so to speak. And so that was just a thought in my mind sometime in the future. And didn't realize it, but that thought, interest, that intrigue became blown out into a full out overwhelming passion. I learned about a, a, what, about a, fr- a person who became eventually a good friend of mine, started a church down in San Diego. We, lived, we were in LA at the time, so about two and a half hours south of us. And so I, in addition to what I was doing, serving where I was serving, I committed to go uh, one weekend a month, Friday night, Saturday kind of deal, come back for Sunday, but um, to help them start that church down in San Diego. And so we did door knocking, surveying, helping with different Bible studies in the neighborhood, leadership meetings, retreats. I, I did anything I could to help that church grow, get started and planned. And then I started reading everything I could on church planning. And, and I attended all these conf- conferences on church planning. And, I heard Rick Warren speak on church planning. For anyone else, ever, anyone else even heard of Rick Warren, he had just started his church. Went to a church planning conference and he talked about it. It's cool stuff. But all that while, and I did that for several years. I, one day, I, God called me to start, not start, but help pastor a church in uh, West LA. And while I was there, and I was great, love the family, the people's there, we, we're still close with many of them. But God still had this overwhelming passion in my heart to start this church. But I still wasn't sure it was from him. And I just didn't know. And, 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 and then one day, I was sharing, I was watching this movie, A Man Called Peter. And, and all of a sudden, it leaked out, and I knew God spoke to me. And I said, Sherry, God just spoke to me. He, he told me that that dream I've been thinking about starting a church, that actually is from him. Wow, it was the first time. It took six years for him to re- help me realize that actually was a passion from him. And then it's like, okay, God, what do you want me to do with that? I set apart a day. We at church had a, had a special prayer room just for prayer. It was really cool. I spent the whole day praying and fasting that day God, in that room. God, what do you want me to do? I'll do anything. Just let me know. That same afternoon, later on, right after I got done praying, I got a phone call from a pastor of the local church, large, large church. Uh, said he was in charge of the local uh, regional church planning agency. He said, our elders just voted to bring you on as a, as a church planning intern. He had no idea that I was praying about that. God moves. Fulfill, he fulfills his call. Three years later, well, actually, it was a year and a half after that, we, start, we moved to start our first church in Monroe, Washington. Now, why do I say this? It took a while, even that was even challenges at times. There's walls, there are impediments, there, there are hindrances. But God blesses it like crazy. No matter the wall, I fulfill my call. What's God calling you to do? You got a purpose. And as long as we're here, we got a purpose. We got a call on our lives. And we need to do our best to fulfill that call. And I believe that God's got a call in your life. And as we start this new year, there isn't a better time for you and I than the present to make a commitment to make the rest of our lives count for Jesus. Our time is short, folks. Our time is short. So how do we go about discovering and implementing our our gifts and our divinely call? And this is where we start learning from Nehemiah's life, his example. Reminder, Nehemiah. So we mentioned last week, Nehemiah had a good life. As good as anyone could hope for in a situation, that is, as people had been exiled into a foreign land. And by the time Nehemiah came around, it had been 150 years. There was 70 years from the first group of people, his people, Jews, were brought to Babylon. Seven years before that first 
expedition went back, were allowed to go back to Jerusalem and resettle. There were three recorded that we know expeditions of people returning from Babylon and then eventually Medo-Persia, because Medo-Persians took over Babylon, back to Jerusalem. Nehemiah was in charge of the third expedition. By that time, it had been 150 years. A long time. And if you think about it, I mean, it was 444 BC, it was 444 BC when he led that third contingency back there. And the purpose was to rebuild the wall. But think about it. If it had been 150 years since those first families had been brought to Babylon, for so many people, I mean, that's all. Bab, I mean, now Medo-Persia was the only place they, those Jewish people knew. That was, they, they'd settled in there. That became their home. They molded into society. They built farm, farms and businesses. And many of them had it pretty good. Nehemiah sure had it good. Remember what we just read? He was cut bare to the king. Remember what the implication for that was? That meant the king entrusted, trusted him implicitly to be able to, uh, the, the king himself would not be poisoned in any way through his food or wine. You had to have someone you really trusted to be in charge of that. So usually the cupbearers were one of the most, they were inner, the inner part of the inner core of Nehemiah, of the king, excuse me. And, and they usually were a trusted advisor. Because only the, you, the king couldn't trust very many people. But he had a good. Look with me at Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1, then we'll look at 11c. It said this. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Achaliah. In late autumn, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was at the fortress of Susa. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. Now, two points here. First of all, the fortress of Susa was the Shushan Palace. And the Shushan Palace was the capital of ancient Susiana. Okay, fine. What's all that mean? Well, that was the favorite winter residence uh, for the Persian kings. In other words, Nehemiah was with the king living in the high life place. He had a good. You know, that was a place of, you know, it's winter right now in New York, but we're going down to Miami. You know, that kind of deal. This Shushan Palace is Miami or whatever it might be. It's the, it's the warmer place, where the, uh, the place where they would go to, and, and that was their, uh, to still enjoy the season. And as we talked about, Nehemiah was entrusted, but he also, God had put a call on him. And, and what really, what's really interesting, he, interesting about this is, the, it was really clear the king did trust him. We'll see that more in chapter 2. So while Nehemiah had it good, his life was turned upside down. And that often happens when we have it comfortable in our life. Our life is short. We don't know how short it is. I, and we can't take tomorrow for granted. We need to do our best seeking him in his call today and to follow his lead today. And we need to trust him in that call. However he gifts us, however he designs us. His call is always better, no matter how difficult or scary it might see at the time. It's always better. It's always better. Read with me in Nehemiah. Chapter, this is a long passage we're going to read right now, because we're going to read most of chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, we're going to read verses 2 to 11. Hanani, this is Nehemiah's writing and talking here. He said, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile, and also about Jerusalem. They said to me, well, those who survived the exile and are back in the province of Jerusalem are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, O oh, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love and those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the, the prayer your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. 
I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We've acted very wickedly towards you. We've not obeyed the commands, decrees, and laws you gave your servant Moses. Remember the instruction you gave your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I'll scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands... Then even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I'll gather them from there and bring them to the place I've chosen as a dwelling for my name. They are your servants and your people whom you redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cut bare to the king. In the midst of his pristine life, God put a call on Nehemiah that he could not shake. It was born out of his love for and concern of his fellow Jews. And they weren't feeling, faring well in their effort to, be, uh, re, to return and live back in the motherland, Israel. And this tore Nehemiah up, Nehemiah up inside. It led him to take some major steps. What were they? At this point, Nehemiah probably did not know it was God who was calling him. He just had this real burden that he couldn't shake. I mean, he prayed and he prayed and he prayed as we read he fasted. We, we read at one point, it was, an, it was in later fall that he heard about when Anani told him about what's going on in Jerusalem and how it was all being destroyed. And then we're going to find out, but it's early spring and he's praying and fasting all this time, praying, 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 praying. Early spring, when God opens the door. At least four months worth. How can we know when God's calling us to do something? Well, let's look and see how Nehemiah's situation and discover some principles. Four key ones, actually. And it's going to be based on this little phrase. If we can, it's, it's, it goes like this. Heart awakening, heart asking. Heart ascertaining, heart advancing. And now, if you want to take a look at it, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and say that with me, um, on the count of three. One. Heart awakening, heart asking, heart ascertaining, Heart advancing, heart awakening, heart asking, heart ascertaining, heart advancing. When my heart is, is awakened, and this is the four points, it starts with our heart being awakened to something, a need. And some need to be, it needs to be fulf- that we need to do, or it needs to be done to fulfill God's mission in some specific way. When my heart starts awakening to that need, God calls us to fulfill a mission. And it usually involves impacting people's lives in some positive, significant way. Look with me at verses 3 and 4 again of Nehemiah 1. This is, Nehemiah, this is Hanani and his friends responding to Nehemiah asking, how's it going? How's it faring with the people back in Jerusalem? And this is what they said. They said to me, things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They're in great trouble and disgrace. The wild Jerusalem has been torn down. The gates have been destroyed by fire. And when I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Now notice here, Nehemiah is the one that initiated the conversation. They didn't, they didn't say, hey, by the way, Nehemiah, do you want to hear what's going on, how, what we found back in, in Jerusalem? Mm-mm. He, as soon as he saw him, he said, hey, how are they doing back in Jerusalem? What's that implying? It's implying they're already on, the situation's already on his heart. How are they doing back there? How are our folks doing back there? Their welfare and, their, and the concern was already on his heart. His heart was already receptive and awakening to the need. And when he learned of their tragic state, his heart was fully awakened. It crushed him when he heard what was going on. It led him to intense weeping, fasting, and praying. He couldn't get the people out of his mind. God had placed such a strong concern for the people and their languishing state in his heart. I remember when uh, Sherry and I were getting ready to start a second church in Antioch, California. We, met a, a, we went to a, it was a, they called it a church planner's boot camp. 
Uh, it was a week long, but it was pretty intense. So that's why they call it a boot camp. And uh, it was good. But we, we met a number of other couples who were preparing to start churches also in the area. And one neat couple, Brant was his name, really liked them. You know, you just kind of, well, we actually, I think we all kind of gravitate with each other because we're all in the same kind of place, getting ready to start a church. And, but Brant really touched me. And I remember him talking about how he had this, it was laid on his heart for the town of Lincoln, Lincoln, California. He said one day he was, he, um, he was just driving through Lincoln and it was God just put the people on his heart. And he said, he was just praying and he stopped, he was stopped at a stoplight and he looked at the car next to him. There's a lady sitting there in the car next to him, you know, at the stoplight as well. And immediately he said he, he was overwhelmed by her. Like he, like, he had this, this, this intense compassion for her. Like she was really lost and in definite need of a savior. And, and, and she looked the same, but outwardly, just like, that's who's, that, like God was speaking to him how she really was. And he just, he said, right there at the stoplight, he just busted down and just started bawling and crying for her. And then for the whole people of Lincoln, California. God had put Lincoln on his heart. Sure enough, God used him and his wife to start a new church, and it did really well, actually. That's what God does. It starts with heart awakening. God awakens your heart to a need, and you just can't, you just can't shake it. Or at least you can, but it's not smart to. You know, what we can do, you know, I'm sorry, but our, our culture, we're really good at being able to um, anesthetize us from God's call in some ways. You know what I mean? What I mean is we can get into our stuff. Distractions are great, are great anesthetics, anesthesia. You know, we're into our TV, we're into our video games, we're into our pro- pet projects. We got to do this, we got to do that, we got to do this. Can't do right, right. And so meanwhile, God's call, hmm, hmm, thought I heard something. Oh, let's keep on going. Right? Get away to hear him. Notice how Nehemiah, what, what did Nehemiah do when he heard about this need? He did, we get into the second point, which we're going to get into, which is prayer. We need to remember, though, at times when we're fulfilling God's call, we're going to encounter those difficult times because we're in a real spiritual battle, a real spiritual war, fighting a real enemy. But regardless of situations, again, regardless of laws, we'll fulfill our call. We have to be fighting for the Lord, but we have to be ready. And the next part is heart awakening. The next thing is heart asking. I devote myself to asking God, praying to honor the specific need, whatever that is, as, as Nehemiah did for his people back in Jerusalem. Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 4 to 6. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, and this is a prayer. We read it already. I won't read the whole thing, but just a couple of verses. Then I said, oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love and those who love him and obey his commands. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer. Your servants praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. Lord, I'm praying to you about these people day and night. Hear my prayer. Heart asking. Heart awakening. And the need. Heart asking. Lord, what are you calling me to do? And now, Lord, I am going to keep seeking you. Lord, you're not letting me go. And guess what now? I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to keep praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. Hard asking. Intensely. God wouldn't leave Nehemiah alone. Eventually, Nehemiah didn't leave God alone. And that's where it needs to start. We want to see God work a miracle and fulfilling a call. You can't do it without prayer. Everything we do as a church needs to be bathed in prayer. Success doesn't just happen. It's God's work. The Bible says, this is Paul talking, I planted a Paul's water, but God gives the increase. Unless we pray constantly, nothing substantial can happen. 
We pray like everything depends on God. We work like everything depends on us. And then we never stop praying and praying and praying some more. It's all through prayer as we ascertain in God's call. And that's the third point. How do I know it's God's call? That goes back in the best part of the prayer time. But that's God. That's hard ascertaining. Ascertain. Okay, like I said, I've been praying for a long time about starting a church. I didn't know if it was just my thing, you know, desire. Got it. I mean, I had thought about or that was that from God. And it took six years of praying until God confirmed it was from him. Hard ascertaining. I begin ascertaining God's call for me regarding the specific need. Well, how do I know it's his call? Well, for one, I'll give you a couple quickies on that. God's call, obviously, will always be in line with his word. Joshua 1, chapter, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8 says, Be strong and very courageous. This is God's call to Joshua to lead the people of Israel to take over Canaan. And this is God giving him the call. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them. Instructions being the, God, the word of God. Turning either to the right or to the left. Then you'll be successful in everything you do. Predicate on following God's word. Study this book of instruction, the Bible, continually. Meditate on it day and night so you'll be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. God's never going to call you to, to do anything that violates this. It's always something that's going to help you fulfill this. So that's one way. Also, how else do I know, can I ascertain if it's God's call? Ask him. Ask God's confirmation for a potential call. He'll speak to his people. He spoke to me through a movie. It was a Christian movie. <laughs> a man called Peter. But he does that. You'll just know when it happens, when God does something, you just know that you know that you know that you know that you know that was God. And as, as, if you don't have, if you never have that, I can't explain it. It's just a fact. I've had it numerous times. I'm sure you probably have at this point. If you haven't, maybe you didn't know. But he does that. He does that. You can ascertain as you seek him. In Nehemiah <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 4. Nick, also, by the way, when you're asking God to answer, <laughs> he says, how often do we do this? Oh, Lord, let me know. Speak to me about this and that. And then we go on and we never, it's like maybe he did, but we didn't hear him because we were in tune. Right? We need to be in tune when he answers. Be in tune when the Lord opens the door. That's the confirmation. That's the ascertaining thing. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 4. The king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven. Whoa. See, let me tell you what happened. Context. Even Nehemiah had been praying and fasting like crazy, as you know. By this point, about four months worth, probably, or thereabouts. And he was sad, still sad. It had been all his time, and he's just, I mean, he's tore up about his people back in Jerusalem having no walls, no gates, and the, and the, and the people around him threatening them. He's like, he can't get them out of their minds. And he's praying, Lord, remember how you said you protect those people. I mean, he just, he just kept reminding God. And then he said, well, maybe God's going to call me to do something. Well, if he does, well, what would I need to do if he's calling me? Well, I need to do this. 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 This needs to be done. Boom, boom, boom. Plans. That's next week. Thank you, Pastor Philip. But... God would have to make it work. He wouldn't even be able to go st step one if the king didn't let him go. And the king really liked him. He depended on him. You, you only have so many few people you can depend on. Confidants, cupbearer here. The king's got to let him go, and it's going to be years. First miracle required. So he's praying and praying and praying. God, if this is you calling me, please let me know. Give me favor with this man. They're talking about the king. And then he's t the king saw it one day he was sad. He, Nehemiah was sad over the people. And, and he said, the king knows his sadness. He goes, why are you sad? He goes, you, you're not sick. This could be nothing but sadness. Scared Nehemiah because you never wanted to enter in the presence of the king. Sad because you want him happy because a happy king is a happy life. You don't want an unhappy king because an unhappy life. 
I said, well, and then, and, and he said a quick prayer. He said, oh, how can I be anything but sad, uh, your majesty? When all my people are in languishing back in Jerusalem, they have no walls and, and their gates have burned down and they're like sitting ducks of the people around them. And I, I'm just, my heart's tore up for them. And that's when the response was, well, how can I help you? Called, open door. God just opened the door right there. You got to be in tune. Well, in order to make it work, this is what I need. Bam, bam, bam. He did not pull punches. Well, you can learn that about next time. But he had, you have to be open. God does answer our prayers. The long ones and the short ones. He had been praying for a long time. And then when the king asked for what can be done, he had prayed a short one right then. Lord, help me right now to say the right thing. God answers those prayers. God was operating behind the scene the whole time when Nehemiah was praying. You can't see when God's operating. So often we're praying. We don't see God operating. We don't see it. We don't see it, but he's operating. We don't see it. You don't see the roots growing underneath when the plant's getting ready to come through. But if they're there, God's operating. We trust. That's a faith thing. And then he'll answer the prayers of confirmation, ascertaining his call. The last point. Last principle. And ascertaining God's call is this. After ascertaining God's call, I begin advancing with gusto. When God opens that door, you go through it. Now, understand, you've got to go by his timing. There's often preparation. I even in mind to do preparation. But you don't let any wall get in the way at that point. You go through it with gusto. Not even little tippy toe them test their waters. No, no, no. You jump in the deep end all the way when God gives you that call. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 5 and 6, when king asked him what he should do, how he could help. I replied, if it pleases the king, if you're pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king with the queen sitting behind him asked, well, how long will you be gone? He doesn't want to lose his friend here. When will you return? After I told him how long I'd be gone, the king agreed to my request. It's going to be a long time, your highness. He was gone a long time. He became governor down there. Anyways, so when God does answer your request, you move with him. You have to trust him how, let him direct. As you get the call, you need to, don't go ahead of him, but don't lag behind. You let him lead, but you're right behind him. Right behind him. If this is a spiritual thing we're talking about here. This is God using you. This is the most important thing. The stuff we're talking about today and this whole series is about the significance of your life. today because when we die and the Lord's going to ask us what we did for him this is what we say share with him how do you do fulfilling my call in the movie Evan Almighty God was calling Evan to build an ark like Noah of old. In the movie, Evan had just become a congressman, a U.S. congressman for his state. And God, played by Morgan Freeman, (laughs) um, had called him, this new junior congressman, to build an ark. And he had no clue. He said, I must be not hearing this right. And he kept resisting that call, knowing that's not God, can't be God, who are you? I'm God. And he kept getting the same call, and the more he resisted, the more God pressed in on him. And he just didn't want to because he liked his new position, and he liked how people treated him. You know, he's this congressman. And he knew if he would do what God asked, everyone would laugh at him, and he'd probably lose his position. One day, he's, one time he was, he was standing up before all of Congress, and as soon as he did, God made, changed his appearance, Evan's appearance, made him look like an Old Testament prophet. Long, old robe, long, flowing beard, white hair, you know, like a long hair, and a staff. Ah, uh, you know, one of those kinds of deals. Finally, he gave in, submitted to God's call, build this ark. 
And it, and it didn't get any easier for him. I had encountered a lot of roadblocks, a lot of walls along the way, a lot of hindrances, a lot of threats by other Congress people, actually. But he knew that God had called him to do that. So he was supposed to do it, and he did it. Eventually, he was vindicated, but it was really difficult until that point. But even if he wasn't in this life, he would have before the king, and that's all that really matters. I, I want us to do something right now. We're going to do, our, you know, we do different things during invitation time. So we're going to do something a little bit different. We've done this before, but I, think, I don't think since before covid could everyone, I mentioned about getting out your connection card. Could everyone get out their connection card right now, please? I want to see everyone hold up your connection card. That's what I'm asking. Please do. I, want, I need one, actually. Thank you. Oh, it's a connection slip, I guess. Connection card, but it's at the bottom. No, it says, what God is leading me to act, to act next. If you would, if you haven't done it already, if you can fail out, of course, the part that your information is, you feel comfortable. We, in the back here, we have our offering plates. But this is what I'm asking. I'm going to say a prayer and our worship team is going to quietly sing for a little bit. But during that time, this is our personal invitation time. I'm going to ask you to ask God, what's God asking you to do? Now, if you don't feel led of any of that's fine. Just take this home and keep praying over it. But if you can, please do. Because God's got a call in your life, and you mean something. You mean a lot. In fact, there's something that you can contribute that the whole kingdom of God is going to be lesser for if you don't. That's true for all of us. So, let me say a prayer, and then we'll read this together, and you can pray about what God wants you to do. Father God, Lord, we've been talking today about your call on our lives. One of the most important things, of course, Lord, that we could be talking about. And Lord, I thank you that every person has a very important role in your, life, in your kingdom. Lord, I ask that you would speak to each of us, Lord God right now what are you saying to us Lord are you, are you waking our heart to anything or have you already been waking our heart maybe we haven't discerned it or maybe we've kind of put it to the side and Lord maybe already we've already been praying about this asking you but we're not sure if it's from you yet, so we're in the ascertaining spot. What does God want me to do? What does God wants us to do as a couple? Well, Lord God, maybe we know what you want. We just haven't really got engaged yet. We haven't started advancing yet. So I ask, Lord, that you would make clear what you want for us. In Jesus' name. As you look through this, we'll just read this. You check as you feel led. And, and, and you don't have to do it right now, but just so you have an heart. It says, what God is leading me to do next? I believe I need to go all the way by receiving Jesus by faith. If you haven't yet for sure committed your life to Christ, nothing like the present. That's, that's the most important call God gives in your life, is that you would know his son so you can become his child and be able to be forgiven of sins and be able to go with him, be with him in heaven forever. Please check that out if you haven't done that yet. Next, I have, a, I have a heart for the lost people in my community that I need to pursue. Is it a particular general thing or is it a particular group of people? If it's a group of people, check that and just put what that group is. Whatever it is, if that's you, then check that. I will ask God to reveal his call in my life. I'm not sure yet, but I want to know it. If that's you, then you check that. I believe that I have ascertained God's call for me. I just need further confirmation or I just need to do the next thing. And that's number last one. I'm choosing to proceed or advance in God's call on my life. Whatever it is, if you would check that, that'd be great as they sing. <laughs>